no less credentials. Right? Okay, can I use the, the marker? So can I go live soon? One minute, one minute. Okay. Yeah, you can go live, madam. Hi and hello everyone. White Army is privileged to have Professor Srinivas sir to our platform as a teacher and mentor today. He is a consultant neurologist from GSL MC Raj Mundri, Andhra Pradesh. He is also author of the renowned best-selling book, Focus Neurology. He also has his own YouTube channel named Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, which teaches neurology from A to Z to everyone in the most simplest way. You can find any other neurology video translated in such a simplest way that too, totally, totally free of cost. So do check it out as YouTube channel. Link is given in the description box. Without any further ado, we can start the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shweta. And thank you, White Army, for giving me an excellent opportunity to address the crowd. Uh, Today, I'm going to talk about a very, very important topic. Uh, it is about pupils. I feel pupil and examination of pupil, the pupillary disorders are very, very important for almost all the branches of medicine, right from MBBS, BDS, physiotherapy, nursing, and even postcardiac courses of general medicine, pediatrics, anesthesia, ophthalmology. So everyone should know about the pupils. Uh, so I'll be talking about the pearls of pupils, the most important concepts, or if you want the detailed concepts, as uh, Dr. Shweta has already said, you can check out my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, which has nearly 13,600 subscribers, and I have uploaded nearly 380 videos. So I'm Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Rajmandri, Andhra Pradesh. My email is 3klpm at gmail.com. My YouTube channel is Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, wherein, I'm, wherein I've dealt about the neurology concepts. And I'm also the medical author of the book, Focused Neurology. Yeah, as, as Dr. Shweta has already said, I have got my own YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts. I have nearly 13.6 thousand subscribers, 282 videos. If you want to know all the concepts of neuro-ophthalmology, I have made a separate playlist in my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, wherein almost all the concepts of neuro-ophthalmology, I have put it, and I'm planning to upload almost all the concepts of cranial nodes also soon in the playlist. But do check out my YouTube channel for almost all the important concepts of neuro-ophthalmology. And I can tell you, this is the best channel to get a simplified version of all neuro-ophthalmology concepts. Yeah, again, I would like to, my special thanks to Dr. Kishan Rao, who has been instrumental in bringing me to this wonderful platform of White Army, nearly 1,25,000 subscribers, a huge number, sir, that shows your popularity and the immense uh, faith the students have in your channel. I'm also the author of the book, Focus Neurology, Entire Neurology. I have put it in a question answer format. It is available from all leading booksellers online, including Amazon. So if you're interested, you can buy this book, Focus Neurology online from Amazon. It's in the question answer format. So it'll be very, very useful, especially for your orals and viva OC in your exams. The pearls of pupils in this one hour also, because uh, very difficult to cover the, all the concepts of pupils in one hour, but I'll try to do cover as much as possible. But if you still have doubts, you can go to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, wherein I've dealt in detail about the uh, pupillary concepts, pupillary disorders and concepts. Yeah, to begin with, we should always talk about the pupillary reflexes. A person comes in a comatose state. A person has met with a head injury. He comes to the casualty. How do we proceed? As the first line medical officer, when you deal with such patients, the first thing we check out is the pupillary light reflexes. The size of the pupil depends on two pathways, the sympathetic pathway 
and the parasympathetic pathway. So the size of the pupil depends on the sympathetic pathway, which gets stimulated in darkness and which dilates the pupil. And the parasympathetic pathway, the light reflex, which gets stimulated with bright light and constricts the pupil. So the sympathetic pathway, which gets stimulated in darkness, dilates the pupil. And the parasympathetic pathway, which gets stimulated in the bright light, constricts the pupil. So pupil size is a delicate balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic. So herein comes a very important question, very important concepts. If the pupil is controlled both by sympathetic, which causes dilatation of the pupil and parasympathetic, which causes constriction of the pupil, after death, when both get affected, the pupil should be in the mid position. That's the doubt we have. But what we see in clinical practice are pupils are dilated after death. It is not in the mid position as we expect. The pupils are dilated after death. So the question comes, why are the pupils dilated after death instead of being in the mid position? Because it is controlled both by parasympathetic and sympathetic. The, there are two schools of thought. The one school of thought is that Though parasympathetic and sympathetic control the pupillary size, it is the parasympathetic which has got more control over the pupil than the sympathetic. And hence, after that, the parasympathetic control is predominantly affected and the action of the pre parasympathetic is the constriction of the pupil is lost. So pupils are dilated. So first school of thought is that pupils are dilated because the parasympathetic has got more control of the pupil than the sympathetic and hence after death, the parasympathetic gets more affected. So the action of the parasympathetic, namely constriction of the pupil is affected. So the pupil is dilated. This is, the, this is one school of the thought. Second school of thought is that though parasympathetic and sympathetic control the pupil, as we are dying during the stage of death as the person is dying, there is a sudden sympathetic surge which causes pupillary dilatation. So in the process of dying, as the person is dying, there's a body is trying extremely hard to make the person be alive. And therefore, there's a sudden sympathetic surge which causes pupillary dilatation. So these are the two schools of thought to account for the pupillary dilatation of the death. And therefore, after death, the pupil is not in position, not in mid position. It is dilated and fixed and not reacting after death. That's why we certify death. How do we certify? We say pupils are dilated, fixed and not reacting to light. The pupils are dilated because of the aforementioned reasons. Right. The principal pupillary reflex responses assessed on examination are the right, are the light reflex and the near response, that is the accommodation response. The normal pupil constricts promptly in response to light. So we have pupil, when we throw light, the pupil promptly responds to light by constriction. Pupillary constriction also occurs as part of near response, along with convergence and rounding up of lens for efficient near vision. So pupils can constrict because of Two reasons. One, when we throw light, pupil constricts. It's a part of the pupillary light reflex. Where in the parasympathetic, where in the light reflex, the parasympathetic gets activated and there is constriction of the pupil. The second is accommodation reflex. Suppose I want to read my slides or I want to read something very close. What do I do? I bring in my accommodation reflex. My two eyes converge. There is rounding of the lens and there is pupillary constriction. So this is known as accommodation triad. So when the pupil is in the small size, physiologically, there are two possibilities. One, there is a light reflex. Second, an accommodation reflex because of the triad that is convergence, rounding up of the lens and pupillary constriction. So the pupillary constriction also occurs as part of the near response along with the convergence and rounding up of lens for efficient near vision. Normally, the light and near responses are of the same magnitude. Right. Now we'll see the pathway for the light reflex, parasympathetic 
and the pathway for the sympathetic, which causes dilatation, the parasympathetic, which causes constriction, the light reflex. Uh, I need your attention because this is perhaps one of the most important reflexes in general medicine and in neurology particular. The pupillary light reaction is mediated by the macula, optic nerve, chiasma and optic tract. The macula is the area for the sharpest vision. Suppose I look at an object, it falls on the macula which gives a very sharp, clear image. That is one of the explanations for double vision where you have false image. What happens in double vision? We have one true image, one false image. Suppose imagine my right lateral rectus is weak. When I look to the right side, I have two images coming up. One is a true image because it falls on the macula. Second is a false image because it falls on the perimacular area. This again goes to show that macula is the area for sharp, clear vision. If the image falls on the perimacular area, it occurs blurred and it is not sharp. So macula is very important. Optic nerve is important. You will realize the importance of optic nerve in pupillary light reflex when I will be talking about Marcus Gunn pupil at the end of this uh, lecture. So optic nerve is very important, especially multiple sclerosis. Optic nerve gets affected. You get relative afferent pupillary defect, RAPD, Marcus Gunn pupil. Then we have the optic chiasma, optic tract. So it comes when you throw light, what happens? The light goes to the macula, optic nerve, chiasm and optic tract. The visual pathway goes beyond that, optic tract, lateral geniculate body and occipital cortex. But the light reflex pathway, even before it reaches the lateral geniculate body, it turns off. So before reaching the lateral geniculate body, pupil reference leave the optic tract to synapse in the pretectum. So in addition to the decussation of the nasal hemiretinal pupillary afferents, extensive crossing occurs to the posterior commissure with the pupillary afferents synapsing both ipsilaterally and contralaterally. So there are two decussations. Because of the decussation, the chiasma, you have the nasal field and the temporal field, nasal fibers cross over to the opposite side and goes. So there's one decussation. Second, from the pretectile nucleus, it goes to both the edinger westphal nucleuses bilaterally. So because of the decussation, the chiasm and the decussation, the posterior commissure, the pupillary fibers are extensively commingled and the reflex is both direct and concentrated. This is the explanation. So if you throw light on one eye, not only the pupil on the same eye constricts, but the other eye also constricts. So the eye which constricts when you throw light directly is known as direct light reflex. When the other pupil constricts when you throw light in the other eye, you call that as a consensual or indirect light reflex. Why is there indirect light reflex? Because of two mixing up of the pupillary fibers. One at the level of optic chiasma, where the nasal fibers of one eye go and cross to the opposite eye. Second, from the pretectum, it goes not only to the ipsilateral edinger westphal nucleus, but the other edinger westphal nucleus. Because of the extensive mixing up at the two regions, we have direct light reflex as well as indirect light reflex. If I show you the pathway, the diagram, you'll understand it better. Yeah. So here you can see the pupillary light reflexes. In this diagram, you can see the optic nerves, the pupillary sphincter. So it goes, so it goes from the optic nerve, the fibers go like this. You have the nasal fibers crossing over and going to the opposite side, whereas the temporal fibers go on the same side. So here there is one mixing up. So from the one eye, the pupillary fibers cross at the level of the optic chiasma and go to the opposite side. So not only to the same side to the temporal fibers, but also to the nasal fibers to the opposite side. So there's one mixing up here. And the second is that the fibers continue like this in the chiasma, go to the optic tract. And this is the lateral geniculate body of the thalamus. But before it goes to the lateral geniculate body, as I've said, before it goes to the lateral geniculate body, it goes to the pretectal nucleus like this. From the pretectal nucleus to the posterior commission, it goes to the edinger westphal nucleus bilaterally, not only on the same side, you can see here, but also on the opposite side. You got it. 
So there are two mixing up of fibers, pupillary fibers, one at the level of the optic chiasma, where there's a mix up of fibers from one eye going to the other eye. Second, at the level of the posterior commissure, not only on the same side, but also on the opposite side. Because of this co-intermingling, because of the extensive mingling at the optic chiasm, as well as the posterior commissure, you have not only direct light reflex, but also indirect light reflex. From the edinger westphal nucleus, it comes and then supplies the pupil. So, pupillary afferent fibers from the right eye are crossed and uncrossed and run in both the optic tracts. They leave the tract before the lateral geniculate body and send projections to the pretectile region bilaterally. The edinger westphal nucleus sends pupillary, pupillary motor fibers to the third cranial nerve, to the ciliary ganglion and postganglionic fibers innervate the pupillary sphincter. Because of the bilaterally of the pathways, a light reflex in the right eye causes pupillary constriction in both eyes. So this is the mechanism. Right. So the fibers from the pretectum to the edinger westphal subnucleus of the oculomotor nucleus complex in the brain, it goes to edinger westphal nucleus. Parasympathetic pupillary efferents from the edinger westphal subnucleus enters the third nerve and travels to the cavernous sinus the inferior branch of the third nerve in the orbit to the ciliary ganglion through the short posterior ciliary nerves to innervate the pupillary constrictor muscle of the iris. Balancing this parasympathetic input from the edinger westphal subnucleus is the sympathetic input ascending from the superior cervical ganglion. The pupillary constrictor muscle is concentrically arranged, whereas the pupillary dilator muscle is radially arranged. Yeah, this is the pupillary light reflex. Now, how do we test the light reflex? The light reflex should be tested in each eye individually. The examining light should be shown into the obliquely, from the sideways obliquely, with the patient fixating at a distance to avoid eliciting and confounding near response. So the person does not look at the distance and looks at the near object and if you throw direct light directly, what happens? Accommodation reflex comes into play. So pupil will anyway is going to constrict with convergence and rounding up of the lens. So to avoid the accommodation reflex, you ask the patient to look at a distance and throw light obliquely. So very important point, the examiner is looking the way you are eliciting the light reflex. He is silently observing. So we have to be very careful give utmost respect to the uh, clinical methods and follow it meticulously. So the examining light should be shown into the eye obliquely with a patient fixing at a distance to avoid eliciting a confounding near response. The normal pupillary light reflex is a brisk constriction followed by slight dilatation back to an intermediate state known as pupillary escape. Escape may occur because of the adaptation of the visual system to the level of illumination. So this is how we test the light reflex. Yeah, so far I've discussed the parasympathetic innervation of the eye. Now we'll go to the next uh, edition, the sympathetic innervation of the eye. Parasympathetic helps in the constriction of the pupil, which can be stimulated by bright light. Sympathetic innervation causes the dilatation of the pupil, which can be stimulated by darkness. Very, very important point. Nice balance. Parasympathetic brightness causing constriction, sympathetic and darkness causing dilatation of the pupil. Very, very important concepts. We need to understand. This is the basic concept. Unless we understand this basic concept, we cannot go further. So now we'll talk about the sympathetic innervation of the eye. As I said, uh, I'm, I'm trying to cover as much concepts as possible, but time is very restricted. If you want more concepts, in-depth, detailed discussion, you can go to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, wherein I've discussed the entire neuroophthalmology. I made a separate playlist of neuroophthalmology. Almost all the concepts of neuroophthalmology, I've explained it in a very simplified manner. And I'm sure you cannot get it in any channel, such simplified concepts on entire neuroophthalmology. So if you have any doubts, please refer back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Sinua's Medical Concepts. 
uh, which has 13.6k subscribers and 282 videos. If you have any doubts, you can contact me through uh, my email cklpm at gmail.com or post uh, comments on your White Army channel. Right. Again, please look carefully at this diagram as the parasympathetic light reflex is very, very important for constriction of the pupil. The sympathetic pathway is very, very important for dilatation of the pupil. Again, I need your attention because these are the two most important pathways to understand the pupillary reflex. Very important in your clinical neurology. Right. Now we'll start and go step by step. The sympathetic pathway to eye begins in the hypothalamus. There are three orders. There are three orders for sympathetic pathway. So if you go here, this is the hypothalamus. From the hypothalamus, the sympathetic fibers descend, goes through the midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata, and goes to the C8, T1 or C8, T2. This is the ciliary budge or sympathetic pathway of pupillary dilatations, ciliary bridge center. This is the first order sympathetic pathway coming from the hypothalamus, coming from the hypothalamus like this, going through the midbrain, pons, medulla, and then supplying the C81. Here again, there are few important questions. Kindly pay attention. When the pons gets affected, when the pons gets affected in the brainstem, both the pupils constrict. You must have seen a lot of patients. Pontine lesion, both the pupils are small constricted. Bilateral small pupils are lesion is in the pons. Now the another question, doubt comes. Why should there be both pupils constriction in a pontine lesion? Why in a medulla oblongata lesion, pupil only on one side is small? Why in pontine lesion, both pupils are small? Whereas why in medullary lesion, only the side of the lesion, the pupil is small? Very, very important concepts, clinical concepts. If you know, you'll really enjoy neurology and medicine. If you don't know, you just mug up facts and then present it. It is not interesting. You should enjoy neurology. You should enjoy medicine. Such fascinating concepts. Now, kindly listen to the explanation. Why in pons you get bilaterally small pupils? Because of the blood supply. We all know that the brainstem and the posterior part is supplied by vertebrobasilar territory. So medulla oblongata, we have two vertebral arteries. They join together as a single basilar artery in the pons and divide it into two posterior cerebral arteries in midbrain. So in medulla oblongata, we have two vessels supplying medulla oblongata. One on right side, one on left side, two vertebral arteries. One vertebral artery on the right side, one a vertebral artery on the left side. But, but they unite to form a single basilar artery in the pons. So pons is supplied by only one artery, basilar artery, whereas medulla oblongata is supplied by two vertebral arteries. And therefore, when there's a lesion in pons, that is a basilar artery is affected, single basilar artery is affected. For example, if there's a bleed, when there's a basilar artery bleed, the blood diffuses to both sides like this because it's a single artery. So both the sympathetic pathways gets affected. So there are bilaterally small pupils, bilateral harness because sympathetic pathway causes dilatation of the pupil. So when it gets affected, it is small pupils. So in a pontine lesion, since it's supplied by single base star artery, when the base star artery ruptures, the hemorrhage goes and hits onto both the sympathetic tracts. Both the sympathetic tracts get affected. It's bilateral Horner syndrome. So we have bilateral small pupils in pons. But in medulla oblongata, there are two arteries. So if one artery gets affected, the sympathetic pathway on that particular side gets affected. So you have unilateral constricted small pupil on the side of the lesion. If this vertebral artery gets affected, the same side sympathetic pathway gets affected. So you have small pupil on that particular side. That's why in Wallenberg syndrome, we get a unilateral small pupil. Whereas in a pontine image, you get bilateral small pupils. The explanation is this. 
sponge is supplied by a single artery, single basilar artery. So when it ruptures, it goes and hits both the sympathetic pathways. So both the sympathetic pathways get affected. So you have bilateral harness syndrome. Whereas medulla oblongata is supplied by two vertebral arteries. So when the one vertebral artery gets affected, you have sympathetic pathway being affected on that side. So you have Horner syndrome, small pupil only on one side. So these is a very important concepts when we are talking about the first order sympathetic pathway. So this is the first order sympathetic pathway coming from the hypothalamus, going through the midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata, and subtraining to the C8T1. So this is the first pathway. Now, first order. Now we are coming to the second order. Second order, what happens? It comes and goes here like this. Here you have the apex of the lung. So apex of the lung tumors can affect the second order pathway. It ascends and goes to the superior cervical ganglion. Superior cervical ganglion. This is the second order sympathetic pathway. From C8, T1, it goes to the superior cervical ganglion. So this is the second order. Here again lies one important concept. So it goes just above the apex of the lung. So if there's an apex of the lung tumors, it affects the second order pathway and therefore apex of the lung tumors also can produce Horner syndrome. Fine? Right. So these are the two orders. Now we are going to the third order. Third order starts from the superior cervical ganglion, goes to the carotid artery. External carotid artery goes and supplies the, the sweating fibers. And therefore, the common carotid artery gets affected, both the sympathetic pathway of the external carotid and internal carotid artery gets affected. So you have a full Horner syndrome. But if only internal carotid artery gets affected, the sympathetic fibers carried by external carotid artery is, is spared. And therefore, you have Horner's minus sympathetic uh, innervation. So from the superior cervical ganglion, it goes to the common carotid artery and from there, internal carotid artery. It joins the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and then goes and supplies the superior tarsal muscles and then the pupillary dilator sphincter. So this is the third order pathway. So first order pathway, the lesion, usually a, a brainstem lesion like Wallenberg syndrome. Second order pathway lesion is usually apex of the lung tumors. Third order pathway, any internal carotid artery, dissection, everything can cause uh, Horner's syndrome, the sympathetic pathway being affected. So very, very important pathways. Neurology, I consider these two pathways as the most important. Sympathetic pathways supplying the innervation of the eye and parasympathetic innervation of the eye. I hope you have understood these three orders of the sympathetic pathway. Having understood, now let's go and talk about it. Right. So the first order neuron descends from the hypothalamus through the brainstem and upper cervical spinal cord. The second order lies in the intermediate leg, intermediate lateral gray column of CA to T2 of the upper thoracic spinal cord, known as ciliospinal center of budge and goes up to the superior cervical ganglion. The third order neuron ascends from the superior cervical ganglion and continue to the pupillodilator muscle. Fine? Right. The postganglionic fibers of the third order neuron lie on the wall of the common carotid artery forming the pericarotid sympathetic plexus. Sympathetic fibers innervating the facial structures follow the external carotid artery at the bifurcation. The sweating is done by the fibers on the external carotid artery. And therefore, the external carotid artery is affected, sympathetic, the sympathetic sweating gets affected. If it is spared, sweating is spared. The sympathetic fibers destined to the eye follow the internal carotid artery. Very important, again, another concept. A lesion proximal to the carotid bifurcation causes complete Horner syndrome, that is stosis, drooping of the eyelid, because the levator palpebrae superior, which is supplied by the parasympathetic, but here the mullus muscle is supplied by sympathetic, so this also causes stosis. Meiosis, sympathetic fibers get affected, so there's meiosis, anhydrosis because sweating on the external carotid artery is affected. But a lesion distal to the bifurcation causes oculosympathetic paresis, that is Horner syndrome minus anhydrosis. So ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis means common carotid arteries involved. But internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery carrying the sympathetic fibers of the sweating. So if there's a lesion on the internal carotid artery, the sweating is not affected. So Horner syndrome minus anhydrosis. 
the perikeratid sympathetic plexus continue along the internal keratid artery in its course through the cavernous sinus sympathetic fibers join the nasociliary branch of the first division of the trigeminal nerve enter the orbit to the superior orbital fissure they continue as long ciliary nerves to the pupillo dilator muscle yeah sympathetically innervated smooth muscle is present in both upper and lower lids to serve as accessory retractors the upper lid muscle is known as mullus muscle which is distinct and inferior tarsal muscle in the lower lid is less distinct so when they get affected you get anophthalmus yeah so now we have seen first the parasympathetic innervation of the pupil the light reflex very very important then we have seen the sympathetic innervation of the pupil which has causes the dilatation of the pupil now we are going to talk about the horner syndrome i'm talking about all pearls on pupils in this lecture we are talking on pearls on pupils all the important concepts but if you want the detailed concepts detailed discussion you can go back to my youtube channel dr sinuas medical concepts with 30.6k subscribers and nearly 282 videos where i have discussed entire neuroophthalmology in detail i made a separate playlist of neuroophthalmology in detail and in a very simplified manner i have explained entire neuroophthalmology a to z concepts yeah horner syndrome as we have already seen there are three orders first order from the hypothalamus to the cat1 second order from cat1 to the superior cervical ganglion third order from superior cervical ganglion to the pupillary dilator muscle the lesion can occur anywhere in these three orders horner syndrome lack of sympathetic input to the accessory lid retractor results in ptosis a denervation of the mullus muscle and apparent anophthalmus so very important the parasympathetic being carried on the third nerve also can cause ptosis third nerve palsy the third nerve palsy also can cause ptosis because third nerve goes and supplies the levator palpebrae superioris the sympathetic also can cause ptosis because it supplies the mullus muscle so that also can cause the elevation of the eyelid gets affected it results in ptosis so ptosis can be caused by both sympathetic as well as in the third nerve lesion very important point but another important point of horner syndrome is it that it causes anophthalmos anophthalmos what is the mechanism the lower lid is frequently elevated 1 to 2 mm the lower lid is frequently elevated 1 to 2 mm because of loss of action of the lower lid accessory retractor that holds the lid down so this is known as inverse ptosis that means the lid goes up inverse ptosis the lower lid goes upwards because normally the lower lid is pulled downwards so the lower lid is frequently elevated 1 to 2 mm because of loss of action of the lower lid accessory retractor that holds the lid down inverse ptosis the resulting narrowing of the palpebral fissure causes an apparent anophthalmosis so there's a narrowing of the palpebral fissure because there's an elevation of the lower lid so you have ptosis you have anophthalmos differentiating anisocoria from horner's and third nerve palsy using light and dark reaction i've just mentioned that the third nerve also can cause ptosis the sympathetic palsy horner's and also can cause ptosis but then how do you differentiate so parasympathetic causes parasympathetic causes constriction of the pupil and if it is affected there's a dilatation of the pupil the sympathetic causes dilatation of the pupil when it gets affected it causes constriction of the pupil so there will be anisocoria so both can cause anisocoria third nerve also can cause anisocoria horner syndrome also can cause anisocoria another important concept of the third nerve is that the parasympathetic fibers run superficially on the third nerve so any constrictive any extraneous lesion like a pcom tumor pcom aneurysm posterior communicating artery aneurysm or any hernia hematoma can affect the parasympathetic fibers which run on the third nerve parasympathetic fibers are the first to get constricted parasympathetic causes constriction of the pupil and therefore it gets affected there's a dilatation of the pupil for example head injury that's why in head injury we immediately look at the pupillary size 
if there's a head injury, there could be extradural hematoma, goes and compresses the midbrain, the parasympathetic fibers on the third nerve, which are superficially placed, and therefore there's a unilateral dilatation of the pupil, what we call as Hutchinson pupil. If that is the kind of examination, examination finding you get, you have to immediately take CT scan, call a neurosurgeon. If there's a hematoma, take the hematoma out. Patient will become completely all right. Such a satisfying experience for you because you have treated a person. If you have not diagnosed and treated, he would have probably died. One of the highly treatable conditions is an extra dual hematoma because of head injury causing asymmetry of the pupils. But an intrinsic palsy of the third nerve, like diabetic third nerve palsy, it causes all the features of the third nerve palsy except pupil, pupils being affected because parasympathetic fibers of the third nerve are superficially placed. So diabetic third nerve palsy causes center of the third nerve being affected. That's why diabetic third nerve palsy is sometimes called as a pupillary sparing third nerve palsy. Right. Now, how do we differentiate the anisocoria? Anisocoria means inequality of the pupil. The anisocoria might be because of the sympathetic lesion or a parasympathetic lesion. How do we differentiate? So in Horner syndrome, the pup small pupil dilates poorly in the dark. So pupillary asymmetry greater in the dark than in the light generally means Horner syndrome. So imagine there is pupillary asymmetry. We would take the person to the darkness. So what happens if there's a Horner syndrome? I told at the beginning of the lecture that the sympathetic pathway causes of the dilatation of the pupil and it gets stimulated in the darkness. Parasympathetic causes constriction of the pupil and gets stimulated in the bright light. Therefore, when you take a person to the dark area, the darkness should dilate the pupil because sympathetic uh, pathway is stimulated. But if there is a Horner syndrome, if there is a lesion of the sympathetic pathway, it cannot dilate the pupil. But the other side, which is normal, will dilate the pupil. So if the anisocoria increases in darkness, it is Horner syndrome. See how lovely the concept is. Anisocoria increasing in darkness is a sympathetic lesion of the Horner syndrome. In contrast, the third nerve palsy causes greater asymmetry in the light because the, of the involved pupil's inability to constrict. Now, you take a person to a, a, a bright lighted room, throw light. When you throw bright light, it stimulates the parasympathetic, it should constrict the pupil. But if there's a third nerve involved, the pupil on the involved side cannot constrict, the other pupil constricts. So asymmetry of the pupillary size increasing in bright light suggests a third nerve palsy. Asymmetry of the pupil increasing in darkness suggests a sympathetic pathway. Very, very interesting concepts. So in Horner's syndrome, the small pupil dilates poorly in the dark. Pupillary asymmetry greater in the dark than the light generally means Horner's syndrome. In contrast, third nerve palsy causes greater asymmetry in the light because of the involved pupils' inability to constrict. But there's another term known as physiological anisocoria. There may be a small difference between both the pupils. So how do we differentiate whether it's a physiological anisocoria or a pathological anisocoria? Physiological anisocoria, whether it is in the dark or bright light, the asymmetry remains the same. So physiological anisocoria produces about the same degree of pupillary asymmetry in the light and dark. So this is how we differentiate a Horner syndrome, a third nerve palsy, and physiological anisocoria. Differentiating anisocoria from Horner's and third nerve palsy using light and dark conditions. Very, very important point. So it will be better understood if you see this diagram. So physiological anisocoria, right Horner syndrome, left third nerve palsy on one side, etiological factors. We have ambient light here. We have ambient light, we have strong light, we have dark and the conclusion. So in physiological anisocoria, if you see, the anisocoria remains the same, whether it is a strong light or in the darkness. So there's the same relative asymmetry under all conditions. But if you see the right Horner syndrome, the ambient light, strong light, the darkness. In the darkness, both the pupil should dilate, but if there's a Horner syndrome on one side, this pupil fails to dilate because the sympathetic path is affected and therefore there's a more asymmetry in the dark, abnormal pupil cannot dilate. So this is a right Horner syndrome using darkness. Now in the third nerve palsy, what happens when there is a strong light? So this is a strong light. When there's a strong light, what happens? 
the the pupil should constrict but this pupil is not constricting the other pupil is constricting normally so the asymmetry more asymmetry in the light the abnormal pupil cannot constrict so with a simple diagram which is a self explanatory diagram we have wealth of information so this is how we differentiate anisocoria from the honors and thernopalsy using light and dark conditions and of course physiological anisocoria there is a relative asymmetry under all conditions yeah so etiology of the honor syndrome i have already told in the diagram explanation first order neuron descends from the hypothalamus to the brain stem and upper cervical cord so the classic lesion is lateral medullary syndrome the second order lies in the intermedial lateral gray column of cat2 of the upper thoracic spinal cord ciliospinal center of budge axons are arch over the apex of the lung and then synapse in the superior cervical ganglion so one of the common lesions of honor syndrome because of second order neuron is apical lung tumors the third order neurons ascend from the superior cervical ganglion and continue to the pupillodilator muscle and one of the classic conditions causing a third order neuron lesion of honor syndrome is internal carotid artery dissection very very important because i'll tell you again in the later part of our discussion how to differentiate how to first confirm honor syndrome and how to differentiate whether it is first order second order from third order neurons they are very interesting uh, concepts uh, which are going to come soon which i am going to tell soon right yeah this is what i've been telling first you should know whether it's a honor syndrome or not second if it is honor syndrome how do we differentiate first sec and second order from the third order uh, sympathetic pathway involvement the localization of honor syndrome how do we localize a lesion of the honor syndrome with the first and second order honor syndrome the third order neuron is disconnected but intact and its terminal connections are sound and viable so with first and second order honor syndrome the third order neuron is disconnected but intact and its terminal connections are sound and viable whereas in a third order honor syndrome the final neuron in the pathway dies and its peripheral process atrophy and disappear so we use cocaine cocaine blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine and therefore norepinephrine levels are increased increasing its effects and therefore cocaine drops distilled into the eye dilates the pupils of the honor syndrome and confirms it but cannot localize hydroxy amphetamine drops causes release of norepinephrine but only from the intact nerve endings so if the third order neuron is intact as with the first or second order honor syndrome the pupil will dilate in response to hydroxy amphetamine if it is a third order honor syndrome there are no surviving nerve endings in the eye to release norepinephrine and the pupils fail to dilate if you see this diagram you will understand it very very clearly so when you put cocaine if there's a honor syndrome if you put cocaine what happens the sympathetic pathway is affected so when you put cocaine whether it is a first order second order or third order there is no response so we have confirmed that it is honor syndrome then we take hydroxy amphetamine when there's a first order and second order lesion the third order if it is intact it is intact may be disconnected but it is intact and therefore when you put hydroxy amphetamine if it is first order or second order it dilates the pupil because the third order though disconnected is intact but if it is a third order honor syndrome hydroxy amphetamines will fail to dilate the pupil so very very interesting these two chemicals these two neurotransmitters you can first confirm the honor syndrome whether it is present or not after confirmation you can even localize whether it is first order second order or third order again very very important concepts yeah so we have seen the sympathetic parasympathetic supply of the pupil sympathetic supply of the pupil localization of the honor syndrome now we are going to talk about 
very, very important about the pupillary size. What is the normal size of the pupil? When do you get dilated pupil? When do you get small pupils? Very, very important concepts, especially when you are examining a neurological case, especially in comatose patient. Pearls on pupils, large, mid and small pupils. As I said, again, I'll be talking about important concepts on this size of the pupil. If you want details of the entire neuroophthalmology, you can go back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Sinwas Medical Concepts, wherein I made a separate playlist of neuroophthalmology. Nearly 40 videos plus explaining all the concepts of neuroophthalmology, which are most challenging, but most exciting. So kindly go to my YouTube channel if you want further details. Dr. Sinwas Medical Concepts. Right. So again, we'll go step by step. The large pupil, mid pupil, mid-sized pupil, and small pupil. First, we'll talk about the disorders of the pupil, the large size pupil. Where do you get the large size pupil? The two conditions most commonly causing a unilateral large pupil are third nerve palsy and Addis pupil. So third nerve palsy usually causes four Ds. What are the four Ds? Dilatation of the pupil because the parasympathetic fibers of the third nerve gets affected, cannot cause constriction of the pupil. So there's a dilatation of the pupil. There is divergent squint because lateral rectus is supplied by the sixth nerve, whereas medial rectus is supplied by the third nerve. So the third nerve and its supply of medial rectus gets affected. The lateral rectus supplied by the intact sixth nerve will overtake. So there is lateral rectus activation. So there is a divergent squint. Because of the divergent squint, because there is asymmetry of the images falling on the macula, there is a double vision. And finally, there is a drooping of the eyelid, levator palpable super is affected, there is drooping of the light. So there are four Ds because of the third nerve palsy. Dilatation of the pupil, divergent squint, double vision, drooping of the eyelid. These are the four manifestations of the third nerve palsy. If it is an extrinsic lesion of the third nerve, the parasympathetic fibers of the third nerve are the first to get affected, like picomaneurism or an extradural hematoma. So dilatation of the pupil is the first to get, is the first to be seen. If it is an in, intrinsic part of the third nerve, like dioptic third nerve palsy, you see the other 3D, divergent squint, double vision, drooping of the eyelid, but you may not see dilatation of the pupil because the superficially parasympathetic fibers are spared. And even if it is affected, it is affected late. And therefore, some textbooks describe dioptic third nerve palsy as a pupillary sparing third nerve palsy. Right. So the two conditions most commonly causing a unilateral large pupil are third nerve palsy and Addis pupil. Because the pupillary parasympathetic fibers occupy a position on the periphery of the nerve as it exits the brainstem, the compressive lesions such as aneurysm generally affect the pupil prominently. Whereas an ischemic lesions tend to affect the interior of the nerve and spare the pupil as in dioptic third nerve palsy because the periphery of the nerve has a better vascular supply. They are superficially placed. Hutchinson pupil. So when there's an extra hematoma because of head injury, it goes and compresses the parasympathetic fibers of the third nerve. So the pupil is dilated on one side. This is Hutchinson pupil, very important. Hutchinson's pupil, the third nerve compression because of uncle herniation causing dilatation of the pupil. So that's why when a person comes with head injury, first thing you have to see is pupillary size. Is there an asymmetry of the pupil? Is there a dilatation of the pupil? If there's a dilatation of the pupil, patient is in for trouble. Already there's hematoma and uncle herniation. Immediately we have to take CT scan, call a neurosurgeon and take the hematoma out. If you take the hematoma out, patient is going to survive and feel so happy, extremely satisfied as a doctor that you have saved a life. So very, very important clinical concepts. So first is third nerve palsy, which causes a large pupil. Second is Addis pupil, which causes a large pupil. What is Addis pupil? The patient presenting with Addis pupil, the tonic large pupil, is typically a young woman who suddenly notes a unilaterally enlarged pupil. The pupillary reaction to light may appear absent, although prolonged illumination may cause a slow constriction. So tonic reaction does not react immediately, slowly it will react. Once constricted, the tonic pupil redilates very slowly when illumination is removed. So large pupil, when you throw light, it does not constrict immediately. It may take long time to constrict. 
when you throw take off the light and put him in a dark condition again it slowly dilates so slow constriction slow dilates the tonicity that's why it's known as adistonic pupil a large and tonic pupil the pathology in adis pupil lies in the ciliary ganglion or short ciliary nose or both the pathology in adis pupil lies in the ciliary ganglion almost close to the pupil or short ciliary nose or both there's a parasympathetic denervation the parasympathetic denervation eventually leads to denervation supersensitivity the pupil may constrict to solutions of pilocarpine that are too dilute to affect a normal eye so how can we diagnose the the adis pupil like how we diagnose hanos syndrome by putting cocaine drops and hydroxy amphetamine here again you can diagnose with pilocarpine when you put dilute solution percentage of pilocarpine it generally normally does not dilate the normal pupil or it does not sorry yeah, the parasympathetic eventually should be super the people may constrict to solution of pilocarpine that are too dilute to affect a normal eye but if it is already denervated becomes super sensitive when it is denervated becomes super sensitive so the parasympathetic denervation eventually leads to denervation super sensitivity the pupil may constrict even to solutions of pilocarpine that are too dilute to affect a normal eye adis syndrome adi syndrome is the association of the pupil abnormality with depressed or absent deep tendon reflexes particularly in the lower extremities knee reflex so since it's parasympathetic denervation even dil dilute solutions of pilocarpine may affect the pupillary size large pupil again another condition is the tectal pupil light near dissociation the term tectal pupils refers to the large pupils with light near dissociation sometimes seen with lesions affecting the upper midbrain such pupils may accompany the impaired abgaze and convergence and restriction nystagmus of the perinot syndrome midbrain is the center for all vertical eye movements pons is center for all horizontal eye movements so when the midbrain gets affected the third nerve is there when the parasympathetic fibers of the third nerve gets affected third nerve cause constriction of the pupil and gets affected there's a dilated up pupil so in midbrain lesions you have a dilated pupil when it is on the top of the midbrain the top of the midbrain uh, like a pineal tumor perinot syndrome on the dorsal part what happens there's not only dilated pupil there's a convergence and retraction nystagmus and there's impaired abgaze so there's a dilated pupil as i said the vertical movements the up and down movements are in the midbrain the up gaze fibers cross over and then descend whereas down gaze fibers don't cross over they descend straight away downwards so when there's a lesion going impinging on the top of the midbrain the up gaze crossing up gaze fibers get affected more but not the down gaze fibers which descend straight away downwards so in the crossing up gaze fibers get affected they cannot look upwards they'll be looking downwards that is a perinot syndrome we get this in hydrocephalus when the eye pupils eyes looks downwards we call that as the sunset sign so there is a selective up gaze palsy in perinot syndrome and pupils may have convergence retraction nystagmus here we need to understand one law which says that when eigen is contact antagonist have to relax this is known as sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation when eigen is contact antagonist have to re relax you have two important laws when you talk about eye movements one sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation second herring's law of dual and equal innervation for example if i want to look to the right side my right lateral rectus should contact but my right medial rectus should be inhibited if both get both contact together how can i look to the right side it will be in mid, in mid position so when my right lateral rectus contacts and agonist contacts antagonist that right medial rectus should relax this is sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation herring's law of equal dual innervation applies to both eyes yoke muscles get equal innervation so when i want to look to the right side my right lateral rectus but left medial rectus should contract together when i look to the left side my left lateral rectus and right medial rectus should contract together they get same innervation so one we are sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation 
when agonist contact antagonist have to relax second we have herring's law of equal dual innervation where the yoke muscles like right lateral rectus and left medial rectus or left lateral rectus and right medial rectus move together in perinot syndrome it's a supranuclear palsy so they don't follow this sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation both agonist and antagonist fire together so both the medial recti contract together both superior rectus and inferior rectus contract together so when both superior rectus and inferior rectus contract together there is retraction when both the medial recti contract together there is a convergence so they have convergence both the medial recti fire together and there is a retraction both superior rectus and inferior rectus fire together why there is no divergence divergence is caused by sixth nerve that is the pons pons is intact the lesion is in the midbrain so since there is a lesion of the midbrain both the medial recti contract together both superior recti and inferior recti contract together so you have convergence retraction nystagmus if a person complains of double vision on looking at near objects it is a third nerve palsy medial rectus palsy if a person complains of double vision on looking at far off objects it is sixth nerve palsy divergence so tectal pupils when there's a lesion of the third nerve parasympathetic fibers on the top of the midbrain dorsal part of the midbrain like perinot syndrome not only you have dilated pupils but you can have impaired up gaze because up, up gaze fibers cross and then descend whereas down gaze fibers descend straight away you can have convergence and retraction nystagmus very very characteristic of perinot syndrome right so far we have discussed about large size pupil now let's discuss another important concept the mid size pupil size is in the mid position both the sympathetic is affected and parasympathetic is affected and therefore the size is the mid size if sympathetic and parasympathetic are normal pupil size is in the mid position if both sympathetic and parasympathetic affected also the size of the pupil will be in the mid position so where can such a kind of pathology occur it can occur in cavernous sinus lesions disorders of the pupil mid size pupil you can occur you can get it in cavernous sinus lesions because sympathetic and parasympathetic go in the go both go in the cavernous sinus the sympathetic runs on the internal carotid artery in the cavernous sinus you have the third fourth sixth and first division of the trigeminal nerve in the cavernous sinus the third nerve carries parasympathetic so both the parasympathetic and sympathetic are placed so close together in the cavernous sinus and therefore in a cavernous sinus lesion both the parasympathetics of the third nerve and sympathetics on the internal carotid artery get affected and the size may be therefore be in the mid position so in the ocula sympathetics are involved along with the third nerve the pupil may be in the mid position because the sympathetic denervation prevents the pupil from dilating fully this occurs often in cavernous sinus lesion where there is a compression of both the third nerve and the pericarotid sympathetics leaving the pupil mid size now we'll talk about the small sized pupils the important neurological conditions causing abnormally small pupils include horner syndrome and neurosyphilis we call it as argill robertson pupil easy way to remember is accommodation reflex present but light reflex is absent light near dissociation so important neurological condition causing abnormally small pupils include honner syndrome and neurosyphilis argill robertson pupil honner syndrome i have already explained so we'll talk about argill robertson's pupil it is seen in neurosyphilis argill robertson's pupils are small pupils and have light near dissociation they react poorly or not at all to light but very well to near the lesion is is supposed to be in the pretectal nucleus where the light reflex pathway travels but the accommodation reflex do not go to the pretectal they take off before lateral geniculate body and go to the edinger westphal nucleus directly not going to the pretectal nucleus and therefore this is one explanation for the light reflex being affected but accommodation reflex being spared we call it as light near dissociation because accommodation reflex is also known as the near reflex so argill robertson pupils are small pupils and light with light near dissociation they react poorly or not at all to light but very well to near argill robertson pupils are the classic eye findings in neurosyphilis the lesion lies in the pretectal area in the rostral midbrain yeah so these are the 
causes of the large pupil, mid-sized pupil, and small pupil. Suppose we see the inact inequality of pupil. One side pupil is large, the other side pupil is small. We call that as anisochoria. That means loss of symmetry. It is asymmetry. So if you see such kind of pupils, one side large, the other side pupil, what we call as anisochoria, how do we approach? So this edition, we will focus on approach to anisochoria. Yeah, again, as I said, I'm only talking about the important concepts of pupils, the detailed concepts. I made a separate neuro-ophthalmology playlist in my YouTube channel, Dr. Sinva's Medical Concepts, wherein I spoken almost A to Z concepts of neuro-ophthalmology in depth. You can go back to my playlist, neuro-ophthalmology A to Z concepts of Dr. Sinva's Medical Concepts YouTube channel. Yeah, pupil, the function, What what is the function of the pupil? The function of the pupil is to control the amount of light entering the eye, ensuring optimal vision for the lighting condition. The normal pupillary size is 2 to 6 millimeters in diameter. The normal pupillary size is 2 to 6 millimeters in diameter. The pupillary size depends primarily on the balance between the sympathetic, which causes dilatation of the pupil, and parasympathetic, which causes constriction of the pupil, and the level of ambient illumination. Darkness will cause dilatation of the pupil through the sympathetic stimulation. Brightness causes constriction of the pupil through the third nerve stimulation. So pupillary size depends primarily on the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation and the level of ambient illumination. The most important determinants are the level of the illumination and the point at which eyes are focused. If you obviously look at a near object, convergence, pupils will become small. If you look at a distant object, pupils will become large. So the most important determinants are the level of the illumination and the points at which eyes are focused. Small pupil, myotic pupil, pupil less than 2 millimeter in size in diameter are myotic. Neurologically significant process of meiosis include Horner syndrome and neurosyphilis. Acute severe brainstem lesions such as pontine hematoma may cause bilaterally pinpoint pupil. You remember earlier part of my lecture, I told pons is separated by single artery, the best artery. So when there's a best artery hemorrhage, blood goes diffusely both sides. Both the sympathetic pathways get affected. You get bilateral Horner syndrome and therefore bilaterally pinpoint pupils in a pontine lesion. Large pupil, midriatic pupil, more than six millimeter in diameter are dilated. Neurologically significant midriasis occur in midbrain lesions like third nerve palsy and posterior communicating artery aneurysms. So approach to anisochoria, whether it is a small pupil or a large size pupil, mid-sized pupil, it can occur normally or in a cavernous sinus lesion where both sympathetic and parasympathetic are affected. The small pupil, two lesions, Honor syndrome and argill robertson pupil, which causes light near dissociation. Large pupil again to important cause of third nerve palsies and addis pupil, which also causes light near dissociation. What is the explanation for light near dissociation? Argyll Robertson pupil. What is the explanation of light near dissociation? Addis pupil. In Argyll Robertson pupil, pretectal nucleus is affected, wherein the light reflex pathway goes, but not the accommodation reflex pathway. So light reflex is affected and accommodation reflex is spared. In addis pupil, the lesion is in the ciliary ganglion and post ganglionic pathway, wherein after the lesion, the accommodation reflex pathway fibers get recovery fast rather than the light reflex pathway. Therefore, the accommodation reflex is present and the light reflex is absent. So you have light near dissociation, argyll robertson pupil. We have light near dissociation, Addis pupil. But argyll robertson pupil is a small pupil, whereas Addis pupil is a large pupil. So the causes of small pupil are Horner syndrome, argyll robertson pupil. The causes of large pupil are third nerve palsy and Addis pupil. Both causes light near dissociation. Anisochoria, aniso, unequal core pupil. Anisochoria, aniso, unequal core pupil. A difference of 0.25 millimeters is noticeable and difference of 2 millimeters is considered significant. In physiologic anisochoria, the degree of inequality remains about the same in light and dark, whereas in Horner syndrome, the inequality is more in the darkness and in third nerve palsy, the inequality is more in the light. We have already seen in physiological anisochoria, same relative asymmetry under all conditions. In right honor syndrome, more asymmetry in the dark, abnormal people cannot dilate. In left third nerve palsy, more asymmetry in the light, abnormal people cannot constrict. Yes. 
Now we will go to another important concept, another important issue: pupil with abnormal reactions. Pupil with abnormal reactions. The disruption of the afferent or efferent limbs of the pupillary reflex arcs or disease of the brainstem pupillary control centers may alter pupillary reactivity to light or near as may local disease of the iris sphincter. Disease of the retina does not affect pupil reactivity unless there's involvement of the macula severe enough to cause near blindness. Direct and consensual light reflex. Why we have direct and consensual light reflex? Direct light reflex is because of the pathway. Indirect light reflex or consensual light reflex, the other pupil constricting when the light is thrown on the different eye. When light is thrown on one eye, the opposite pupil constricts. This is known as consensual light reflex or indirect light reflex. This is because of intermixing of the pupillary fibers from one eye to the other eye. The intermixing occurs at two areas, one at the level of the optic chiasma, where the pupillary fibers cross, cross through the nasal fibers and go. Second, at the level of the pretector nucleus, wherein the fibers go to bilateral edinger westphal nucleus. Because of this crossing at two levels, there's both direct as well as indirect light reflex. Because of the extensive side-to-side -side crossing of the pupillary controlled axons to the posterior commissure, light constricts not only if the pupil stimulated the direct response, but also its fellow the consensual response. The eye with the severed optic second nerve will show no direct response, but still will have a normal consensual response to a light stimulus in the other eye, as well as constriction to attempted convergence. So when my right second nerve is affected, when I throw light, it cannot constrict. But the third, uh, but when you throw light on this side, the afferent pathway is intact, the optic nerve is intact, goes to the pretectal nucleus, edinger westphal nucleus bilaterally. The third nerve on this side is intact, only the second nerve is affected, but third nerve is intact, so it will constrict. So in the second nerve palsy, the direct light reflex will be absent, but when you throw the light on the other side, the indirect light reflex is present because second nerve is affected, afferent is affected, but efferent third nerve is intact. So the eye with the severed optic second nerve will show no direct response, but will have a normal consensual response to light stimulus in the other eye, as well as constriction to attempted convergence, because convergence, we have a separate center. The pupil frozen because of the third nerve palsy, that is the efferent fiber is gone, will have no near response. If you throw light, Afferent is intact, but efferent is gone, so it cannot constrict. But if you throw light on the other side also, it cannot constrict because final pathway is gone. So the pupil frozen because of the third nerve palsy will have no near response and no direct or consensual light response. But the other eye will, in, will exhibit an intact consensual response on stimulation of the abnormal light. So if, if the afferent is affected, if you throw light, the right light reflex, the direct light reflex is affected, but consensual light reflex is present. But efferent if it is affected, that is a third nerve is affected, no matter whether you throw light on, on right side or on the left side, there is no constriction of the light on the affected side. So very, very interesting concepts. If you just use your logic, you will really enjoy all these concepts. That's why I find neurology very, very interesting, very, very challenging. All you need to know is understand the concepts just medical concepts, neurology concepts, so fascinating. I don't think you can enjoy such wonderful concepts in any specialty. Yeah, so, so far we have spoken about all this. Now we'll talk about the last edition, the last chapter of this class, relative afferent pupillary defect or otherwise known as Marcus gun pupil, classically seen in multiple sclerosis. Yeah, as I said, this particular chapter itself, I dealt in detail in my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts. So if you're not able to understand, you can go back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, where I've, where I've dealt in detail about all these principles, concepts of neuroophthalmology, a separate playlist of neuroophthalmology in my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts. So over to Marcus Gun Pupil. Marcus Guntiol means the second nerve is affected, optic nerve is affected. Classically, you see this in multiple sclerosis. So what happens? When you throw light, it will not constrict. When you throw light, as we just saw, it will not constrict. Direct light reflex is affected. When you throw light here, both will constrict 
and now slowly it will start dilating when you throw light. So now again, when you throw light, instead of constricting, it will be in a stage of dilatation because there's a lag. So when you throw light, it will not constrict. When you throw light to the other eye and then come back, instead of constricting, it is in a phase of dilatation because of the concentral light reflex. So when you compare both sides, that's why you call it relative. Afferent, the second afferent is affected, not the efferent, pupillary defect. That's the name, relative afferent pupillary defect. If I show you with a diagram, you'll understand it better. So the weaker direct response or the paradoxical dilatation of the light stimulated pupil to the optic nerve disease is termed as afferent pupillary defect, example, multiple sclerosis. It is due to the pathologic pupillary escape phenomena. It escapes pupillary escape and termed as secondary dilatation under continued exposure due to optic nerve disease. So now let's see with this diagram. So you can see here on the right side, there is an afferent pupillary defect. This is the left side is normal. So you have four diagrams, so one, two, three, four. So on this side, the right is affected, relative afferent pupillary defect. Vision on the right is, sorry, the right is normal. Left is affected. Vision on the right is 20 by 20 and vision on the left is 20 by 200 because of the optic neuropathy. So when there is a dim light, the pupils are in dim light are equal. Now what happens the second stage? You throw light directed into the left eye, which is affected. So you are throwing light into the left eye. You can see in this diagram, we are throwing light on this eye, which is affected. So we are throwing light on this eye, which is affected, where the vision is only 20 by 200. The right eye is normal. So the right eye is normal, 20 by 20. The left eye is abnormal, 20 by 20, 200. So in dark, both are equally dilated. But when you throw light on the affected eye, light directed onto the left eye, which is affected, results in a partial and sluggish constriction in each eye. Because light is not able to travel to the optic nerve since there is optic neuropathy, probably multiple sclerosis, neither direct nor indirect are very brisk. There is no brisk constriction. So now what happens? You take this light and throw it on the normal right eye. So light directed into the right eye results in a brisk and normal reaction in each eye. So when you throw light on the normal eye, there's a constriction of the normal eye. The efferent is intact. And so this is also constricting. So when you now, when you bring the light back to this side, during this intermediate stage, since you have removed light, both are in the stage of dilatation. So now when you throw light, the light quickly is redirected into the left eye, resulting in dilatation of the both dilated, both pupils. Swinging the light back and forth will bring about the dynamic anisocoria. So when you throw light on the right normal side, both pupils are constricting. So when you are bringing the torch light from the right side to the left side like this, during this intervening period, both the pupils have started dilating. And now if you throw light, it is not in the stage of constriction. It is the stage of dilatation because the optic nerve is not functioning well. There is a relative afferent pupillary defect, example, multiple sclerosis. So the light quickly directed into the left eye, resulting in a dilatation to the both eyes. Swinging the light back and forth will bring about the dynamic anisocoria. This is known as swinging flash light test otherwise known as Marcus Bergen pupil, seen well in persons of multiple sclerosis. So these are the fascinating concepts of uh, pupils and neuroophthalmology. Other important concepts of neurology, I have put it in a question answer format, very useful for medical students. It is available in the entire world, online from almost all the booksellers, including Amazon. So whether you are in, in whichever part of uh, the globe you are, in whichever part of the country you are in, just you can type focus neurology on Google, you can get it on Amazon, you can buy it online. Whether you're in US, UK or India, no matter where you are, you can get this book because it's available online from all leading booksellers, including Amazon. Since it's in a question answer format, very easy to understand, it will not be boring because just question answer, just question answer, not didactic detailed lectures. It'll be very useful for students appearing for the exam, especially oral exams. MD general medicine and for MBBS even to some extent will help you in your theory. So if you're interested, you can buy this book online from all leading booksellers, including Amazon. As I said, in this one hour or so, I could only touch upon the important concepts of
pearls on that's why i named it as pearls on pupils but if you want detailed concepts on pupils please go back to my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts where in i i i'm planning to make about 175 uh, parts on cranial nerves i've already made 40 episodes on neuroophthalmology and i've already made a playlist on neuroophthalmology a to z concepts you can go back to my neuroophthalmology playlist of dr srinivas medical concepts and get full information if you have any doubts you can connect back to me through the white army or through my email or on my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts so these are the wonderful concepts of pupils and pearls on pupils yeah i think this is the last slide yeah over to the organizers white army for giving such an excellent opportunity uh, on talking about pearls on pupils uh, this is this is it from me thank you over to the organizers of white army i think i've finished in time yes sir thank you so much it was indeed a very comprehensive and uh, an interesting class sir we are so grateful to you and uh, as always uh, we need a teacher like you to make neurology actually easy so thank you so much thank and uh, we can see in the next session hopefully sir we need thank more you. and more classes from you like this sir i hope you will get interested in neurology and take up neurology as your so super speciality sure sir yeah Okay thank you and uh, thank you all the participants who have joined us via zoom and youtube